So I think we will just go ahead now if that's okay. So welcome everyone. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Richard Weller, who's an academic dermatologist and principal investigator at the Center for Inflammation Research at the University of Edinburgh in the United Kingdom. In 1996, Dr. Weller was the first person to describe nitric oxide production on the skin surface and his research is primarily centered around exploration of the role of nitric oxide in the skin. He also regularly visits Ethiopia where he's involved in training local dermatology residents and collaborates with other physician scientists to study the immunology of cutaneous leishmaniasis. We are thrilled to have Dr. Weller join us today um, and to give a talk on a somewhat controversial topic in dermatology, sunlight, the benefits as well as risks. We hope you enjoy. Dr. Weller, over to you. Um, Monty, thanks. And it's not controversial at all. What I'm going to tell you is gospel and everyone else is wrong. But th that aside, um, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's great to be here and, uh, and great talking to this audience. So, so, so as Monty says, I'm academic dermatologist. I, um, I spend about half the week seeing patients and about half the week I do research. And I, I really started this research off in Scotland, then in Germany, and I was in Pittsburgh for a couple of years before bringing it back here. Um, just conflicts of interest first, I should say I have um, co-founded a, a company um, uh, making better sunscreens and in a cunning attempt to conceal my association with it, it's called Dr. Weller. I don't think anyone has spotted that. So um, look, I'd like to start off really talking about a little bit of an anecdote and a talk about convergent evolution. So about 30 years ago, a friend asked me to help him sail his boat from Britain out to the Azores in the Mid-Atlantic. And I'm always happy to jump on and do something like that when somebody else is paying for it. So we headed down to the Scilly Isles off the southwest coast of, um, of England, um, where we jumped off across the Atlantic from. And the night before we headed off into the big blue ocean, um, they had the local sporting event, and in, in the Sillies, um, the big sporting event is gig racing. They race these pilot cutters, enthusiastically followed sport. It's what baseball is to Americans. And it was fascinating watching it. So, so what the gigs were for, these pilot gigs were for, was for delivering pilots to ships coming up the channel. So the English channel is very dangerous. It's full of rocks. If you get it wrong, you hit a rock, you sink. So you put a pilot on board who can navigate the ship up the channel. And these pilot gigs evolved in the 18th and 19th centuries to do that. And there were a number of features they had to have. They had to be fast because it was the first person who got to the incoming ship who got, got the job. So they had to be fast enough to get out there faster than the others. They had to be seaworthy because these are boats heading out into the Atlantic. They had to carry a spare man, the pilot, who was just sitting there until he started his job on the ship. And they had to be beach launched because there's no good harbours um, on the Scillies. And these pilot gigs evolved um, and um, they, they're about seven metres long. They've got sort of five or six swarts for about you know, seven or eight oarsmen double-ended, carvel built. They are superb boats for the job. And, and they did this for a couple of hundred years until the invention of the steam engine. Well, we watched that and we set off the next day and we sailed for about 10 days, um, the pair of us um, across the Atlantic before arising, arriving in the middle of the Atlantic at the Azores. And as we arrived, or we arrived, we dropped anchor and there drawn up on the hard was what to me was a pilot gig. It was identical to those boats we had seen in the Sillies. Except one thing confused me. There is no history of putting pilots on ships in the Azores. The Azores are volcanic plugs which arise where the European and American tectonic plates meet. They come straight out of the ocean. There are no rocks to hit because they're just these volcanic tips. So there's no need for pilots and there's no history of putting pilots on boats there. So we asked one of the locals, the Azorians, what this was. And this is um, in an open whaling boat, an Azorian whaling boat, because what the Azorians did to get food and money was whaling. And their boats had to be fast because you've got to catch the whale. They had to be seaworthy because you're going out into the Atlantic. They had to carry a spare man 
the harpooner and they had to be beach launched because there's no harbors on these volcanic plugs. And what they independently evolved was an identical boat to a Cillian pilot gig. It's six or seven meters long, it's got five or six thwarts, it's got six or seven oarsmen, it's double-ended cargo built, the identical boat. And this struck me at the time as a beautiful, exa beautiful example of convergent evolution, where you end up with the same phenotype from a different starting point because evolutionary pressures, similar evolutionary pressures drive you to that ideal phenotype for those conditions. Now, what does this mean to dermatology? Well, of course, here we are, these identical baits. As a dermatologist, one of the most interesting examples of convergent evolution is skin color. Those of us who are not African are descended from the small bands, probably only a few hundred peoples who left the um, African continent, our human homeland, sort of 60 to 80,000 years ago, and scattered around the world. So discrete bunches scattering around the world. Now, as we moved around the world, we encountered different UV environments, different amounts of sunlight in the different places that these human bands ended up. And what is interesting is as people's, different peoples moved into low light environments, they independently evolved pale skin. And the closest predictor of skin color in any groups of humans is the amount of UV um, in the environment to which they live. So you can plot latitude, which is an approximate uh, indicator of UV against skin color, and you get this very tight correlation. So this is telling us something about sunlight, uh, evolutionary fitness, benefits and disadvantages of sunlight that we have this powerful driver. Now, what about the situation here in Northwest Europe? So where I am in Edinburgh at the moment, um, 10,000 years ago, was covered in ice. There was an event called the Lesser Dryas, the ice returned, um, and humans were driven out of um, Northwest Europe, most of which became Arctic tundra. Until around 9,000 years ago, the ice melted, and the first peoples moved back into Northwest Europe. So these were the Western Mesolithic hunter-gatherers. Now, in the last two years, or the last sort of 10 years, two technologies have come together. The first of these is the understanding. We've got good understanding, or relatively good understanding, of the genetics of skin pigmentation. And the second technology is ancient DNA. We are now good. There's a few laboratories which specialize um, in recovering and analyzing DNA from ancient skeletons. So we can actually look at what early humans looked like. And one of the surprises that has come out um, is that, so this is um, Cheddar Man. So this is the earliest um, human uh, known in Britain. So from 9,000 years ago, this is Cheddar Gorge in England where um, he was discovered about a hundred years ago. Published in Nature um, three years ago. So those Western Mesolithic hunter-gatherers who first populated Northwest Europe had dark skin and blue eyes. So here's Cheddar Man. And then here's another paper, um, another of the Nature Stable, published um, even more recently um, from Denmark, again, Northwest Europe, and at that time, of course, connected by land with Britain. Um, and this was not from a, a, a bone, in fact, but from he had been chewing on pine sap. So here's five and a half thousand years ago, a Western Mesolithic hunter gatherer. And again, dark skin, blue eyes. So for the so the Brit Britain, Northwest Europe, has been populated for about 9,000 years, and half that time it's been populated by dark-skinned people, and only 5,000 years ago is there a shift to pale skin. And that pale skin, in Europe, this is uh, driven by an SLC24A5 variant, which first arises down in Anatolia, modern Turkey, around 8,000 years ago, amongst the, the, the first farmers, the Neolithic farmers. And they, over 3,000 years, spread up through Europe, uh, arriving here in the British Isles and Denmark and Scandinavia around 5,000 years ago. 
Now, convergent evolution, the gene variants leading to pale skin in East Asia, in China, are different. So in China, it's the Kittel G variant which arises, and that becomes prevalent around 10,000 years ago. So there's a beautiful review which I strongly recommend to any of you who are interested in this, written by Nina Jablonski, um, where she looks, um, and she, of course, is the, the kind of queen of uh, anthropology of skin color. So here in these two discrete populations living in a low light environment by different genetic roots, pale skin, the similar phenotype evolves. So it's an example of convergent evolution. And this tells us that sunlight must be important because repeatedly humans evolve pale skin in low light environments. So there's got to be, a, and, and pale skin allows you to get more UV, more of its biological effects. So pale skin, this tells us that sunlight must be important. And down in Southern Africa, for instance, SLC 24A5 um, is reintroduced to Southern Africa after those first humans um, have left um, uh, just a few thousand years ago. And there's also a relaxation on MC1R. And by South Africa, I mean the SAM right down in Southern Africa, um, which is actually quite high latitude. It's at as high a latitude as Southern Europe is, but in the opposite hemisphere. So again, another example of low light environments drives this selective pressure for pale skin. So sunlight must be quite interesting because we develop these adaptations. And what you have here is you must have two opposing climes. There are benefits, there are evolutionary fitness benefits for having pale skin, and there are evolutionary fitness benefits for having dark skin. And when the input is the amount of solar UV, or the, the, the you get the output of skin color. But what determines that skin color output is the amount of solar UV as an input to this kind of evolutionary fitness machine. But what are the risks and benefits of sunlight which drive this? Well, the first thing to say is we never hear about this. All we ever hear about sunlight is sunlight is bad for you. It causes skin cancer. So this is the Cancer Research UK website. The, the only bit it talks about sunlight. I could do the same for Australia. I could do the same in America. I could do the same in any European country. All we talk about with sunlight is skin cancer and aging and photodermatoses. But our advice to the population is avoid sunlight. But is sunlight... It is, is that the correct answer? I think that Adewale Adamson has spoken one of these previously. So he's doing tremendous work. Um, I really enjoy um, his, uh, his papers. This is JAMA Dermatology last year. So Adewale was writing about um, melanoma in African-Americans. And, and his finding is that UV-induced melanoma doing a meta-analysis of the trials out there, is not a risk factor for melanoma, the skin cancer that matters, in, in, black, in Americans of African descent, Black Americans. Now, I actually, it was great to see that in 2021. Long before that, my colleague and friend, Dr. Aklelu, who is um, one of the three dermatopathologists in Ethiopia, population 100 million, had been saying exactly the same thing. So to him, this is writing a few years back, talking about melanoma. So Aklelu does not, it, it is in Ethiopia. He sees all the derm path. So Ethiopia is in the tropics. It's at two and a half thousand meters altitude. So there is shed loads of UV in the tropics at high altitude, enormous amounts of UV. And Aklelu, does not see UV-induced melanoma. So here's him writing, we've seen that disease looks like in our communities, so we should approach the situation from real experience now, as in what he's seeing, not from others' experience. So a clearly trained in Germany, and in Germany he saw lots of melanoma, and he saw lots of solar elastosis UV damage. That's what he was used to in Germany. 
But what strikes him back in Ethiopia is he doesn't see UV-induced melanoma or the solar damage. And as he says, being a dermatologist reminds me of skin cancers. In our curricula, the Ethiopian curriculum, we talk a lot about the skin cancers that Caucasians suffer from because the literature is Western. We do have some skin cancers too, in you know, acral melanomas, marginal insulters, but far from the amount in the West. Rather, we have other conditions that are of public health importance that seek attention. So I was delighted to see this formally presented um, in JAMA Dermatology last year. But talk to an African dermatologist in Africa and you'll hear the same thing. So that's a bit about skin cancer. But what about the big killers? What are the most important health problems in the world today? So the World Health Organization um, actually summarizes this. It produces data on what are the big killers in the world today. And it does that by disability adjusted life years. It's a mixture of mortality and morbidity. And the leading, the most recent data, the leading cause of DALIs in the world today is high blood pressure. It has overtaken smoking. Smoking control has move smoking down one place, the second place, which is great, but high blood pressure underlies strokes and heart attacks. And what is interesting about blood pressure is if you look at population blood pressure by country, so this graph on the left, each of these dots is a different country in the world, and the data is taken from back in the 1980s, before modern antihypertensive agents were widely used, because the, the graph now has changed. Rich countries, blood pressure has gone down because in rich countries we've aggressively treated it. But before those drugs were available, you see this powerful relationship, about 26% of variation in blood pressure um, is determined by the latitude of a country. So this is the equator up the middle, southern hemisphere on the left, northern hemisphere on the right. Now, different countries, different diets, different makeups, different occupations, different exercise, sure, sure, sure. But look within a country, so within a country by time of year. And what you find, I've thrown up this example, there's, there's masses of these, because this is what I learned when I was at medical school. It was one of the early uh, antihypertension uh, trials, beta, beta blockers and thiazides, old fashioned stuff now. But when you analysed blood pressure by month of the year, blood pressure is significantly lower in summer than in winter. In fact, the seasonal effect is as big as the drug effect. Now, what could be causing this? That's an observation. What could be causing it? The first thing is to get rid of the vitamin D canard. Okay? So the vitamin D industry in America alone is worth $3 billion a year. Because it's a supplement, not a drug, you're pretty much unlimited in what you can say about it. And of course, if you look at people with hypertension or cardiovascular disease or stroke or all-cause mortality, lower levels of measured vitamin D are associated with increased hypertension, increased cardiovascular disease, increased stroke, increased all-cause mortality, all mortality. People with lower measured vitamin D levels are healthier in pretty much every way you can think of. But rule 101 of epidemiology, correlation is not causation. To prove causation, you have to have an intervention, a clinical trial. And there have now been quarter of a million people in trials of vitamin D supplementation for a number of things. And what you find is that vitamin D supplementation has absolutely no effects on blood pressure, absolutely no effects on myocardial infarction, absolutely no effects on strokes or cerebrovascular disease. It might affect some cancers. And the Mendelian randomization studies show pretty much the same thing. And in fact, the, w, the NIH um, in the States of the Dutch Supplements report concluded it's not possible to specify a relationship between vitamin D and health outcomes other than bone health. Look, vitamin D stops you getting rickets. We've known that for 100 years. That's a, that, and that's important. You know, people, people with low vitamin D levels are at risk of rickets. There may be a few small other benefits, but nothing like the size of the benefits which we see in the correlation studies where there is a powerful correlation between low vitamin D and something else. So if it's not vitamin D, what could it be? So I'm now gonna segue on to some of my work, which does not account for all the benefits. I'm not gonna say my stuff's a panacea like vitamin D is claimed to be panacea, because it's not. However, my interest has been in nitric oxide, 
and the um, classic way that nitric oxide is made. So the Nobel Prize for Medicine back in 1998, um, the three Americans who described NO, I won't mention the fact that a Brit actually wrote the first paper. It's a different story. But um, nitric oxide is cleaved from arginine by one of the nitric oxide synthase enzymes, um, where it has its biological effects, endothelial drive to relaxant factor, Viagra, you know, whatever. It's a vasodilator and lowers blood pressure. And initially, it was thought that the way or the way in which NO is inactivated is it is oxidized from NO to NO2 nitrite to NO3 nitrate. A nitrate was said to be biologically inert. And the idea was that is how you turn off the activity of NO. And it's then peed out in your urine. But first of all, um, first of all, it was shown by um, uh, John Lundberg at the Karolinska and Ben Benjamin, my old mentor who started me off on this, a series of papers about 20 years ago when I started this stuff, 25 years ago. And they showed that actually there's a reverse pathway, nitrate NO3. There are nitrate reductases, mammalian nitrate reductases and bacterial on the tongue that will reduce that NO3 to NO2 where in acidic conditions and go back to NO. This is why athletes eat beet, because uh, what we call beetroot, what you call beet in America, because beet is stuffed full of nitrate, and nitrate improves NO delivery and thus athletic performance. Even more importantly, from my point of view as a dermatologist, and those of you who are dermatologists from your point of view, is that a third mechanism by which NO can be produced was described by my friend and collaborator, Martin Felish, back in 2003. Um, and this was a paper in PNAS. And he showed that nitrate, NO3, um, in the presence of thiols, SH groups, the skin is awash with thiols, cysteine has got it on them, UV will photoreduce NO3 to nitrite in the presence of thiols and skin brings all those ingredients together. So I had been doing, I mean, I was over and I started off as a good boy dermatologically, believing that sunlight was bad for you. And like all other good boys, I trotted off to America to try and work out how this was. And I was interested in NO, and I'd shown the NO is produced in the skin, and I was trying to work out what it was. And I, I, was, I was looking at apoptosis in cells and things. And I went off to Pittsburgh for a couple of years and did my mouse mock-up models in America. And I got my BTA certificate. That, that means been to America, for those who haven't got one. All of the stuff you need for your career. And I came back, and I could not reproduce my mouse working man. Um, and what we found in problem-solving these experiments that took two or three years I discovered that the skin contains huge quantities of nitrate, nitrite, and RSNOs. So this was back in the early 2000s, really around, and I couldn't see a reason for it. Now, I managed to publish it in the JID. I was amazed. I couldn't see the point of this, um, but you know, I told the JID it was terribly important, and I managed to persuade them, although I didn't believe it myself, but thank you for the JID. Um, a highly cited paper since, I might say. So we'd be these big stores, and then Martin came up with his paper showing that UV and thiols will photoreduce nitrate to NO. And suddenly it was one of those eureka light bulb moments. Because here in the skin, you have these ingredients that will release NO. And of course, I remembered from medical school, seasonal changes in blood pressure. I knew that blood pressure was hugely important. I knew from my years as a junior doctor that you didn't take holiday in winter because that's when the hospitals are busy. You have 23% more admissions with heart disease and strokes in winter and summer. And there was a kind of unwritten rule. It was unsporting to take your holidays in winter because you are really busy at work then in the hospital. Dermatologists forget that. And so we quickly published a, a paper in uh, the European Heart Journal, Martin and I and a couple of other colleagues, suggesting that maybe NO releases, maybe UV releases NO to the circulation. It's really just kind of mark our territory. Um, and we then set out to prove this was the case. So I did uh, spend a couple of years on this, got a PhD student, Donald Liu. And first of all, we showed that if you shine UV at the skin, it releases NO in the skin, this green fluorochrome, but not sham radiation. Uh, I, we then set off to, I then set off doing forearm plesitomography. So rather than using mice, I use medical students, a, a cheaper experimental animal and, and closer to human. So what you do for this forearm plesitomography, it's like an isolated organ bath, but in, in real life. 
you um, you put a, you put an arterial cuff around the upper arm and you inflate it above venous but below arterial pressure. So blood can flow into the arm but not out. And you put a strain gauge around the forearm. And by the amount the strain gauge goes up, you can tell blood flow into the forearm, which is a function of arterial vasodilatation. You then cannulate the brachial artery. Advice, get a friendly cardiology trainee to cannulate the brachial artery. You do not want dermatologists guddling around with the arterial vasculature. But you can then infuse into this forearm um, uh, LNMMA, which turns off that Nobel Prize winning nitric oxide synthase pathway, but it doesn't turn off the NO3 to NO2 to NO pathway. So you rule out one pathway, so the pathway that's left is this alternative pathway. Uh, and you let the cuff down every now and then to stop the arm falling off. And what you show is that when you shine UV at the skin, it is a direct arterial vasodilator and the sham irradiation is not. So sunlight is an arterial vasodilator. And you then do whole body irradiations, either with active UV or with sham, where they're covered with foils and they warm up in the same way, but rays don't hit the skin. So when these UVA lamps are turned on, blood pressure drops in sham and active, because you get warm, and if you're warm, your blood pressure falls. But when you turn the lamp off, the sham group who just got warm, blood pressure returns to normal, but not the active group. And at the same time, in the active group, you have an increase in heart rate. And as you'll remember from medical school, fall in blood pressure, increased heart rate, vasodilation. So it's showing you got vasodilation. And you showed that in the active, but not the sham, you get a rise in circulating nitric oxide. So UV is an arterial vasodilator, which releases NO from the skin, which lowers blood pressure, and blood pressure accounts for 18% high blood pressure of all deaths worldwide. It is the biggest killer in the world today. Sunlight lowers blood pressure. So, oh, I gave a TED talk if you're interested. 1.2 million hits. I think my mother, I should say, is a million of those, but there are a few independent viewers. And I should also say we used UVA, or I used UVA, because it doesn't make vitamin D. It wasn't for anything cleverer reason than that. The whole of the idea of sunlight having benefits has been thought to be vitamin D, and, and it's not. And what I wanted to say was this was a vitamin D independent effect, which is why I chose UVA lamps. But as I'll move on to, that might mean a UVB may be even more effective. So, OK, so you've got risks of sunlight, you've got benefits. We know about skin cancer, we're dermatologists, but here are benefits. What's the, what's the risk benefit ratio? And here I should turn to um, Pelilinkfist's work. So there are several epidemiology studies. They all come from Scandinavia. Not that the Scandinavians are different from us. It's just that they collect the data. So Pelly has been analyzing the melanoma in southern Sweden study. So this study started in 1990. It recruited 20% of all middle-aged Swedish women in the southern half of Sweden. So big data, that's 30,000 Swedish women. In, and in 1990, they were asked four questions about their sun use. Do you use sunbeds? Do you sunbathe in summer? Do you sunbathe in winter? In Sweden, bizarre, they do. Or do you go on foreign holidays? Now, clearly, lots of confounders associated with this. If you go on foreign holidays, you're, you're richer, you're probably better educated, you're less likely to smoke, et cetera, et cetera. But they corrected for lifestyle factors, exercise, smoking, alcohol. They corrected for social factors, income, education, marital status. Uh, everyone's tax return is published openly every year in Sweden. On a date of the year, if you want to see what your neighbor earns or the president, you can just look it up on the website. Um, pregnant, they also looked at health things, pregnancies, BMI, comorbidities, other diseases. So they extensively corrected for confounders. So went back 25 years later to see what, the, and the first thing I should say is more UV does, surprise, surprise, correlate with more cancer, more melanoma. But what about death? That's the one that matters to me. And what he showed is that dose dependently, the more sunlight you have, naught to four, the lower your risk of dying. And in fact, those people who ignore their dermatologist's advice and get the most sunlight after correcting for all those confounders are half as likely to be dead as those goody two-shoes who do what the dermatologists say and don't step outside. Correct for all confounders. And what was interesting 
was that the core, the major cause for this reduction in death is a reduction in cardiovascular mortality. In fact, Pelly went back a couple of years later, and what he finds is because the sunlight exposed people live longer, there is an apparent increase in cancers. And that's because you divide deaths up into accidental cardiovascular and cancers, or cancers cardiovascular and the rest. And if you've got a reduction in cardiovascular death, something's gonna get you in the end. So there's an apparent increase in cancers. The other thing he showed, gosh, I haven't got the slide in here. The other thing he showed in a paper he published last year was he went back and he looked at the redheads versus the non-redheads. And so I don't have the slide here, it's in paper in PLOS One. And what he shows was that it is in a low light environment. So those people who only got naught or one sun exposure got not much light. In the low light exposure group, redheads have a survival advantage over non-redheads. But when you move into people with higher light exposure, that survival advantage is lost. So redheads, the palest of the pale, have a survival advantage in a low light environment, it's all cause mortality, but not in the higher light environment. So presumably the reason that red hair is found most frequently in Northwest Europe is it an adaptation to a low light environment. You can get more of the benefits from sunlight. Um, but it's, it's not an advantage in a higher light environment. Again, it's an example of this evolutionary fitness, this drive to paler skin in a lower light environment and a drive to darker skin in a higher light environment. So what does this mean? Well, because I, I, I'm interested in blood pressure because it's measurable, it's a hard end point. Dermatologists have been completely uninterested in my work and I've actually stopped submitting to dermatology meetings because I'm sick of a poster in the corner, you know, a paper that gets hundreds of citations and is a poster, I just don't do it. But I've been taken up by non-dermatologists and I uh, published a paper together with the renal research institution. So the RRI is the research arm of Fresenius who provide most of the dialysis centers in the United States. And the great thing about dialysis patients is they have their blood pressure measured three times a week, week in, week out. So Fresenius has got um, over 340,000 dialysis patients on their book. Um, they have got 2, 000, over 2,000 different dialysis centers scattered across America. Uh, and this is a paper we published in the Journal of the American Heart Association about 18 months ago, two years ago. So we went and we looked at a third of a million dialysis patients in 2,000 centers, thrice weekly blood pressure measurements for three years. So this was terabytes of data. And to summarize a wonderful long paper, um, what we found was that, and we could, we could then correct for things. So the great thing about having 2000 different dialysis center is you can use satellite data at each of those centers to work out how much UV is falling there and what wavelengths. And you can also look at the temperature there. You can get temperature data. So you can look at UV, temperature, other confounders. And what we find, as before, is that independently of temperature, the more UV you are exposed to, or the more UV where you live, the lower blood pressure. That fall in blood pressure is greater for UVB than UVA. If you remember, I did UVA in my initial studies, just because I wanted to say there's not a vitamin D effect. Even more importantly, I think, is that the fall in blood pressure was about 25% greater, the steepness of that curve, that UV blood pressure curve, was about 25% greater in our, in our 200,000 white Americans compared to our 100,000 black Americans. So if you have darker skin, you need more UV to get the same fall in blood pressure. It's not surprising. You know, you've, skin, skin color's role is to mediate between the UV and the environment and your internal biology. That's all it does, but it's really important. It reduces the risks, skin cancer, but it also reduces the benefits. So that was uh, published two years ago. So does this really matter? So here am I talking about, well, you know, you're dermatologists, you're all terrified of sunlight and you tell people not to go in the sun. 
<clears throat> but let's have a bit of a look at this. So we're saying sunlight lowers blood pressure. So in the UK, in Northern Europe, the seasonal variation in blood pressure is, it's pretty accurate actually, it's five point, it's about six over three, six systolic and three diastolic millimeters of mercury. That is the seasonal variation in blood pressure. And about half of that variation is due to temperature because from our uh, renal dialysis, our renal paper, we know that the temperature does account for about half the variation, but UV independently of temperature accounts for the other half. So the thing about blood pressure is basically the lower your blood pressure is, the healthier you are. And there is a straight line relationship. There is a big meta-analysis published in The Lancet six years ago. And this is reductions in major cardiovascular events. That's heart attacks, strokes, heart failure, the big killers. This is reductions in cardiovascular events against reduction in systolic blood pressure. So this is a meta-analysis of lots of blood pressure reduction studies. And what it shows, it, there is a straight line relationship. The more you lower your blood pressure, the greater that reduction in major cardiovascular events. So six millimeters of mercury predicts about an 18 to 20% reduction in cardiovascular events. And that in fact is the seasonal variation in cardiovascular events that we see in Northern Europe. The other important thing to say is again, two more meta-analyses published in the Lancet last year, is it doesn't matter what your blood pressure starting point is. The benefit from your, B uh, hypertension is not a disease, it is a classification. In America and in Europe, in the last five years, we have lowered our classification of hypertension by 10 millimeters of mercury. At the stroke of a pen, three million patients were created in America. Big story in the cardiology world. Insurance companies hated it because suddenly they had three million patients to pay for. And the reason for this is it doesn't matter what your starting blood pressure is, you get the same reduction in um, cardiovascular events by reducing blood pressure. If you're starting off with a blood pressure of 120 systolic, what's regarded as healthy, or more than 170. So lower blood pressure is better, whatever the starting point. And lower blood pressure is important, whatever the age of the patient. So this is different age bands. You know, older people have more events than young people, but the reduction is the same. So whatever age you are, whatever your blood pressure, you could do with lower blood pressure. Sunlight lowers blood pressure. So here we have cardiovascular mortality is 23% higher in winter than summer in the UK. So annual deaths in the UK from melanoma, about two and a half thousand, from cardiovascular disease, about 170,000. So, so we are predicting that the UV alone, if so let's do a thought experiment. Let's say that by we could completely eradicate melanoma by getting your patients to change from summer levels of sunshine to winter levels, okay? Let's say you could, now I should point out, of course you wouldn't, because actually, well, you wouldn't, but just for the thought experiment to make the sums easy, let's make that suggestion. So you've removed two and a half thousand melanomas, but you're expecting with that 10% more cardiovascular deaths just from the UV. So can I suggest to you that 17,000 deaths a year is actually rather more important than preventing two and a half thousand deaths from melanoma? Okay, okay. Age standardized mortality, younger people get melanoma than heart disease. Age standardized mortality, 2.4 and 74, a reduction of seven is still bigger than 2.4. So it just doesn't make sense. And that is why there is not a single paper anywhere in the world showing that by avoiding that, that sunlight increases all cause mortality, completely different from smoking and alcohol and obesity and poverty and airborne particulates, all of those things increase all-cause mortality by various different mechanisms. Sunlight causes skin cancer, not a single bit of evidence showing that it shortens life. In fact, the opposite. So moving on to a couple of other things. I know that time is moving on. I'm sorry about the late start. So can we use daily UV to treat hypertension? I've got a paper coming out quite soon, I hope. I ran a pilot study on using UV to treat hypertension. So I recruited patients with mild hypertension, the mildest form, which usually treat lifestyle factors. 
We randomized them. We did a sham array. We, we, it was a, a double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover study. So they either got UV or they got sham radiation, washout period in between, and then the other side of the intervention. Now, here, here are that UVA lamps. The amount of UV we were giving was very low. We were giving five joules per centimeter squared of UV. So that is equivalent to 17 minutes of summer sunshine in uh, June in Scotland, or 15 minutes in Sydney, Australia. I'm sorry, I gave you this talk in Australia last. So not much, okay? 15 minutes of summer sunshine in somewhere sunny, or um, you know, two hours in winter, 41 minutes in it. So not much UV, and it was UVA. And these were home phototherapy plants. The first thing to say is we had huge problems recruiting. Patients with mild hypertension feel completely normal. It's not like doing my eczema clinic where patients are desperate for treatment. Patients with mild hypertension feel absolutely normal. So it's quite hard to recruit them. And we hugely under-recruited and we had to pull, pull the plug on the study early, sadly. However, we showed that our clinic blood pressure showed a reduction in BP um, in, the, in the active but not sham group. So again, I repeat what I knew before. We were not able to show a change in 24-hour blood pressure, but I think the problem there was possibly UVB is more important. And secondly, we probably weren't giving enough UV. We were giving UV for two weeks. Um, the other thing is I've since done some work with a wonderful Brazilian PhD student who came over with me. And we actually showed that the UVB wavelengths, I've, I've used UVA because it doesn't make vitamin D, but actually, that study where we looked at the renal patients, UVB was more important. And we also find that, in fact, we get NO, a peak of NO release in the UVB area. So I think UVB may indeed be more important. I want to go and revisit this. So, so that's, that's I, I've still got up blood pressure because you can measure blood pressure and it's the biggest killer in the world. And why not start with the important stuff rather than the Cinderella stuff around the edges? I'm going to quickly move on to just finishing off a bit of COVID. Um, COVID, we are all aware of COVID. COVID cropped up two years ago. And I was aware, we were talking about influenza to start with, and I was aware that influenza was seasonal. And although our hospitals are full in winter because of cardiovascular disease, they're also full because of respiratory diseases, the other thing that, see, that shows strong seasonality. And I wondered whether there might be seasonality in COVID. Problem was, we hadn't had 12 months with it. But America started releasing your data on COVID deaths at county level, the Johns Hopkins um, collation of data. And I got together with uh, epidemiology colleagues from the geography department here. And what happened was America started releasing deaths at county level. So America's 50 states, but it's 3,200 odd counties. And deaths were coming out at county level. And we thought, gosh, America's so big, unlike Britain, you've got lots of different UV environments around America. So let's let's take that. So at each county level, so so we thought let's look at UV and let's look at COVID deaths. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that. You don't sit down with an Excel spreadsheet and knock this off in 10 minutes. You actually do three months of hard work because there are lots of confounders you have to correct for. So to die of COVID, and we use death because it's such a great endpoint, you know, it is, it's a definite one. So to die of COVID, several things have to happen. You have to meet somebody with COVID, you have to catch it, you have to get sick, um, you have to be admitted to hospital probably, and then you die or not. So lots of things. Now, different confounders affect that. So we constructed this um, multi-level zero inflated negative binomial model, and that's why you employ epidemiologists and mathematicians, isn't it? So you correct for those facts. So the first thing was that each county, we had to correct for the population density of each county and the percentage of that population with COVID and also public transport use. Because if you're living in North Dakota, North Dakota in January 2020, um, first of all, hardly anyone lives there. Secondly, they're driving their trucks around. Thirdly, no one's got COVID. So you're not going to meet anyone with COVID. If, however, you're living in Manhattan at the time, you're squeezed in on the subway, half the world's got it, very pop rich population, isn't, very dense population. Isn't. So you correct for those factors. So you do your zero inflation correcting for your risks of catching COVID. You then need to put in the next correction, which is your risk for dying of it. And we know the factors that age that are age, ethnicity, deprivation, uh, pollution, temperature, humidity. So you put in corrections for that next, OK? And then finally, we put in a random, there are then cultural differences. Um, 
you know, down in South Carolina, they yeah. don't believe in COVID and don't wear masks. Up in New Hampshire, it's a different. So you then put in a random state level model, just accounting the random effects, you know, social health insurance in different states. So you have this very complex model. And the final thing is we missed out the 20% of American counties where vitamin D would be formed by UV. Because remember, it's only UVB that makes vitamin D. So you can omit uh, the counties which were down here in this yellow part of the graph uh, where vitamin D is made. So we looked at the 80% of counties, 2000 odd, in what we called their vitamin D winter. So what did we find? Well, what we found, here we are, sorry, two, two and a half thousand counties, um, is that the more UV there was, the lower the deaths from COVID. Great, that's America. What else can we do? Well, we then went and we repeated the study in England. Now, in England, we, we, we collect our data differently, you know, different, so we basically had to do a different study because the way we collect data is different, but it showed the same thing, more UV, less COVID deaths. And then we went to Italy, and in Italy they collect their data differently. For, for instance, they didn't have, they didn't uh, record COVID accurately, so we had to use excess deaths. But again, the same thing, more UV, less COVID deaths. So UVA so UV, independent of vitamin D, more UV correlates with less COVID deaths. The effect was more marked actually at lower levels of UV. Anyway, go and read the papers, we're running short of time. Um, a group from America at the same time was doing something similar and real sore point here. We both submitted to PNAS at the same time. We both got lovely reviews back saying we love this. And then after six months, PNAS said we changed our mind. We think it's rather boring. And they published the Harvard group and not us. I, um, we, were not, we were not happy. Anyway, this group from Harvard did a, a sort of related analysis and they looked at the growth in cases of COVID. A very nice paper again. And what they showed was that moving, they looked at rates of increase of COVID. And they showed that in moving from January to June, um, there was um, a, in the Northern Hemisphere, so moving into the summer in the Northern Hemisphere, a fall in new, case, in new cases of COVID um, that related to UV, but not to temperature or humidity. And of course, in the Southern Hemisphere, moving into their winter, the direction of the change was an increase in cases. So we showed UV and deaths, they showed UV and increased cases. Two good papers, I think. So what's the mechanism? Well, the first thing to say, again, it's not vitamin D. There have now been, this is the paper that came out in JAMA last year. There are, there are lots of reviews out there. Just like heart disease, strokes, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, lots of things, higher vitamin D correlates with better disease outcomes. But when you give people vitamin D, it has no effect. So here's the big, the, the Brazil study uh, published in JAMA. There have been others since. And the Mendelian randomization studies show the same thing. So there's not a vitamin D effect. Um, I haven't got time to talk about possible mechanisms, but we've got some thoughts here. Well, that's all observational. So I have then started working with a um, group, Cytokine. Some, uh, 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 Cytokine is a venture capital company, which has, like me, has got interested in the benefits of sunlight, um, they, the, which are not vitamin D driven. Because if you can find what is in the middle, you know, sunlight goes in here, better health outcomes here. It's not vitamin D. What's that magic bit in the middle? Bingo, that's big. So they funded this um, important pilot study that was run by Frank Lau, who's a, a Yale alumnus, he was telling me. And um, last year, yes, so the, uh, last year, over three months last year, the, uh, over, I think, July to, um, anyway, over a three month period last year, he ran this study down in New Orleans, an intervention study. So they were, he was recruiting patients admitted to hospital, admitted to LSU, um, a hospital in New Orleans, with positive COVID, oxygen levels of less than 94%, but not ventilated. So they were sick, but not kind of pre-morbid sick. Here's the, the flow chart, you know, 200 positive ex inclusions, exclusions, et cetera, et cetera. Ended up with 30 who were randomized. And they were randomized either to get daily narrowband UVB, according to the American Academy of Dermatology Phototherapy Guidelines, or a sham. So this is double-blind, placebo-controlled. 
Now it's small numbers because he is a pilot study, but the groups were well matched. And what he finds in the placebo group, there were five deaths. In the UVB phototherapy group, there were two deaths. So th it's not quite significant, but it's a pilot study. But the direction is in, in the right way. And it backs up our observational studies about UV and COVID deaths. And here's an interventional study showing the same sort of thing. So exciting stuff. I'm interested to take it. So the kind of summaries, is sunlight good or bad? So, well, so the hazards, yes, it causes skin aging. Hmm, it causes skin cancer. Well, I mean, we know it causes skin cancer because of the epidemiology. White Australians get more skin cancer than white Brits. They did three years longer, but you know. Um, we, and the mechanisms, we know all about the kind of pyridine dimers, the kind of UV, the sort of genetic, the key, the, 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 the signature mutations from UV in SCCs and so on, and intervention. We know from the Nambour sunscreen study that if you put sunscreen on people for five years, you reduce the number of SCCs. But a couple of things. First of all, um, and I think Adewale Adamson has spoken to you, there's this whole problem of melanoma overdiagnosis. You know, in the last 30 years, this huge rise in melanomas diagnosed, no change in deaths. Well, I mean, we've got the checkpoint inhibitors and things in the last five years, but I don't think we got so much better. So there's a lot of melanoma overdiagnosis, New England Journal paper last year. Uh, secondly, can I also point out that the WHO reclassified uh, its, its classification of melanomas three years ago based on etiology. And the commoner garden superficial spreading melanomas are now typified by the WHO as low cumulative sun melanomas, because when you look at them histologically, there isn't solar elastosis. There aren't the changes of chronic sun exposure. So melanoma is a disease of sunburn, not chronic sun exposure, thus the new classification. Secondly, absence of UV-induced melanoma in, in Africans, in people with dark skin. Yes, acral melanoma, but that's not UV-induced. Um, so there is no risk there. So if you're doing any alterations of interventions, we're always thinking risk benefit ratios. Well, if the risk is next to nothing and you're saying don't go in the sun and there's no gain because there's hardly any risk, you, you know, you've got to be absolutely certain there's no benefits to sunlight. And in fact, there's lots of benefits to sunlight. Oh, and finally, BCCs. Remember that when you have your basal cell skin cancer diagnosed, your actuarial life expectancy goes up. So the correct response when you diagnose a BCC in your patients, as we do all the time, is to say, congratulations, you're leaving my office with a longer lifespan than when you came in. And I think that's grounds for celebration. Oh, and we'll nick it out you know, easily and sort it out. So that's the hazards. Well, the benefits. I've spoken about all-cause mortality. I've, I've spoken a bit about cardiovascular mortality and infection. I haven't had a chance to touch on the stuff we're doing on metabolic syndrome and obstetric outcomes. Do a quick Google Scholar on me. Got lots of stuff happening there. Evolutionary fitness. Why do humans in low light environments keep on evolving pale skin to get more UV? There's got to be a gain. Mechanisms. Well, vitamin D, important for some of it, you know, rickets and stuff. Not unimportant, but it's not the whole story. Living in a cave and taking vitamin D supplements, I'm paraphrasing the AAD advice, but that's pretty good, isn't it, um, is not the answer. Nitric oxide, I think, is very important for the cardiovascular bits, but I don't think it's the whole story. We've got a lot of gene regulation stuff coming out, and there's mechanisms to be discovered, but we are not looking. So we need to think about sunlight being good. We need to think skin color is really important when it comes to giving advice on UV, because that's, you know, you're, you're trying to get these risks and benefits and what determines where you are on this scale is skin color. I'd like to finish really with a couple of observations as to um, why we've got this so wrong. And this is not data driven, this is just my thoughts because I've been mulling over why we dermatologists have got sunlight so wrong. And I went back to the very beginning of the UV skin cancer story. So the first proof that UV causes skin cancer, definite proof, animal models, interventions, placebo controlled, was George Findlay. It came from Edinburgh University, where, where I work, my university, this very town. And he produced the paper in 1927, um, published in the Lancet, 1928, where he showed if you shine UV at mice, they get skin cancer, and not if they don't. Well, nobody's, 
hundreds of citations, you know, a citation classic. Whenever you write a paper about UV and skin cancer, you start with this paper. <clears throat> so I had a quick look into who he was, because he's not a dermatologist. Who was this guy who appears, blazes of glory, and disappears? So he, he um, studied medicine here, qualified in 1915, got his DSC in 1922. He then worked in the Imperial Cancer Research Laboratories, the Imperial Cancer Research Laboratories in London, where he did his work on UV and skin cancer. And he then went to work for the Welcome and the Royal Army Medical Corps in the Gambia and Sudan and West Africa. And he studied yellow fever and Rift Valley fever. This is the height of the British Empire. He was dealing with problems of white skinned Brits going out to the British Empire. The diseases he concentrated on, the diseases where the funding for research was, was for Brits going to Africa and India and Australia, white skinned Brits, to whom you, a, a UV environment to which they were not adapted was a problem. I, I benefit from that. I, um, I turned 60 in about six weeks time, frightening thought. My grandfather went to uh, East Africa in 1927. At the time, Findlay was doing his work. When he went to Africa, it was thought that the heat of the sun was the dangerous thing. They wore spine pads. Findlay's come, works come out saying, actually, it's the rays of the sun. My mother growing up in East Africa, in the uh, 50s, um, they realized in the 40s and 50s, they realized UV was the problem. So then it was kind of clothing and so on to protect you from UV. When I was growing up in Southern Arabia um, in, um, in the 1960s, this is me um, in, overlooking Aden Harbor, we had the sunscreens that helped. So I, people looking like me, white skin in the tropics, have all of this research supporting us and helping us. Britain now is a multi-ethnic nation, far more interesting. My, my children are from Ethiopia. My children come from 3,000 miles due west of this same latitude and have made the reverse migration. So there's 100 years of research about what happens for North Europeans going to the tropics. There is none for the equal but opposite migration for people using from very sunny countries to low light countries. And in fact, we so the ill adaptation is equal but opposite in terms of evolutionary adaptation. And in fact, the advice we give, wear sunscreen, keep out of the sun, is the advice that was designed for people looking like me in the tropics. Fine in the tropics, unimportant in Scotland, and dangerous, I would say, and wrong. Um, for somebody who's made the opposite migration. So I hope things will change. I was over in Washington, D.C. Um, about five years ago, I was invited onto a National Academy of Sciences working group looking at UV, and we published in JAMA Dermatology and a sentence in my life's work. The positive effects of UVR exposure should not be ignored in the development of new sun safety guidelines. Absolutely right. And I hope it will give you pause for some sort. So thank you very much. Need a quick, uh, just a few references over the last um, couple of years here. My research group, obstetricians I've worked with, haven't touched on that. Metabolic uh, biologists haven't touched on that. Anyway, questions. I think I've slightly overrun. I apologize. Thank you so much, Dr. Weller, for that incredibly engaging and insightful talk. I am ready to wash off my SPF and go sit in the sun. Um, but I will um, open the floor to uh, the audience if they have any questions. Um, I know Dr. Richmond has just written something in the comments. Um, beautiful talk, Dr. Weller. Thank you. I agree. Her question is, how do you think we could reconcile risk benefit ratios for patients with photosensitivity? For instance, in lupus, UV can trigger a flare, but now you've got me thinking about protecting blood vessels. Yeah, look, absolutely. So you know, if people have a condition which leads, that specifically gives them a problem with the UV, of course, that's, that's really important. I'm talking about the general population. So, and the kidney patients, you know, if you've had a renal transplant, for God's sake, keep out of the sun, you're on immunosuppressives. We know that group is particularly at risk. And if you've got photosensitivity. So sure, but it shouldn't be the general advice. The sun protection advice is, is for those people with ACE, but you know, if you've got XP, if you've got lupus, um, if you've got some, you know, if you've got chronic actinic dermatosis, you know, those are the people 
to give sun advice. And the other thing is the melanoma thing. Melanoma is a disease of sunburn. It is not a disease of sun exposure. You know, and until the Industrial Revolution, as a species, we have lived our entire life out of doors. You know, we were hunter gatherers and then we were farmers. And then about 150 years ago, when they invented steam engines and blast furnaces, we moved into factories and cottages. Until then, our entire life was outdoors. How did we get through it? Well, perfectly well, thank you. Continual low grade chronic sun exposure is the norm. Thank you. Monty, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course. Thanks. Um, thank, uh, first of all, thank you for that talk. It really um, is very refreshing in so many ways. Um, and I, I thank you for sharing your work um, with, with our audience. I, I have a quick question about um, how sunlight might affect mood. So I'm, I'm at least familiar with a paper by David's Fisher group, David Fisher's group showing that UV can trigger production and release of beta endorphins. And I'm, I'm wondering how mood factors yep. in here. Yeah, absolutely. So I was talking at a uh, Montagna symposium that David was at, at around the time he produced that. And, you know, the push was, oh, it's a drug, it's an opiate, you know, look at these drugs, how dangerous, clear evidence, you know, you've got this drug, you're, you're a druggie wanting your sunlight. So can I refer you to science? This is either this week or last week's edition of science, when they've been looking at bee foraging, a really interesting paper. So they find that evolution, so uh, rewards that make you feel good. So sex and eating and bee foraging, three things that are really important in terms of evolution of fitness, you've got to have sex, you've got to eat, and if you're a bee, you've got to forage. They all have the identical dopaminergic system in the brain. The feel-good thing makes you want to do it. And work, sunlight makes you feel good. It's an opiate thing. Well, I think there's a whole variety of reasons why we've got UV wrong. A bit of it coming from Scotland. I can remember having... Uh, is this kind of Calvinist, if it's enjoyable, it must be bad for you. You guys don't live in Scotland. This kind of Calvinist Presbyterian thing, if you, anything you like has got to be evil, you know, and being it so, you know, sex, you know, you know, sex, gluttony. Well, actually, in evolutionary terms, I don't think that's right. And um, I think sunlight does. And of course, look, I, I touched on cardiovascular disease and I touched on infection. There's the whole thing about seasonal affective disorder. There's myopia. There's a whole series of diseases, um, a whole series of diseases where you have common factors suggesting sunlight a benefit. So the vitamin D association, more vitamin D, less disease, latitude changes, seasonal changes, and vitamin D intervention, giving vitamin D having no effect. So actually, there's lots of diseases that meet those criteria. So those epidemiological things suggest sunlight. So myopia epidemic now, uh, heart disease, diabetes, stroke, we publish stuff on obstetric outcomes, uh, asthma, there's a whole series of these things. Now, you know, you've got to find the mechanism. But um, the other thing, you know, every cigarette you smoke shortens your life by four minutes. You know, when your blood pressure falls by five minutes of mercury, that reduces your heart disease, whatever. When you go and see your GP, um, and they measure your cholesterol, your primary care, you know, they feed that cholesterol into a calculator, which then gives you your 10% risk of death. When you look at um, exercise, you know, the 10,000 steps a day, looking at people's exercise predicts their lifespan, the more exercise, the longer they live. So can you think of any paper showing sunlight, more sunlight correlates with reduced, more, with increased mortality? There are none. There are none. A hundred years after Trevelyan showed that UV leads to skin cancer. There is not a single paper showing that sunlight shortens life, which is completely different from every other risk factor on which we give advice. Thanks, Dr. Well, I know um, we're going a bit ahead of, uh, I mean, over schedule, but there are a few more questions. I don't know, Bill, do we have time? <laughs> If it's okay with you, Dr. Weller, but we also want to... Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. It, it gets me out of feeding the children. Um... <laughs> so there's one from Aaron Hughes. Um, he asks, were you able to account for salt consumption in the epidemiological studies? Um, well, look, salt um, leads to high blood pressure. Um, no, so look, so with our dialysis patients, yeah, their salt was incredibly carefully controlled. 
So uh, the, the Journal of the American Heart Association paper where we looked at the 340,000 dialysis papers, yes, sodium levels in intricate detail, you know, into dialysis, weight gain, into this, absolutely. Um, the, so, yep, yeah, absolutely, no salt effect there. The, you know, the sort of, the, the, the blood pressure by, mean blood pressure by country, no, but um, we've got C's, but, you know, there are huge numbers of data points um, and the seasonal blood pressure, um, you know, people are, are not having huge different salt diets through times of year, but no bit of evidence by itself is the whole story. You know, so we know that sunlight causes skin cancer because we've got the epidemiology, Texans are more than Alaskans. Um, we've got the mechanism and you've got interventions. Now we've got all of those for skin cancer. We have got almost all of those for UV cardiovascular disease, epidemiology, People that get more sunlight live longer. People living close to the equator in the summer. In, in summer, we have less deaths and things. Mechanism, well, I'm giving you the nitric oxide. We haven't looked for anything else because we've been fixated on skin cancer and haven't stood back and said, well, actually, does it really matter compared to all-cause mortality? And interventions, well, we're just starting those off. So, you know, you've got to, you, there is no bit of evidence by itself is enough. You've got to produce them all. Thank you. And I think our last question is by Dr. David Perez Meza, who asks whether you've seen more FFA related to the use of sunscreen because they have seen um, more FFA possibly related to sunscreen use. So from sulfide raising alopecia is this or? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I can't say we, we don't see a lot of sun in Scotland and so our experience is and then the other thing is some um, I like big data um you know I like data with hundreds and thousands um we're, we're currently looking at the UK bar bank with half a million I love the uh renal thing with 340,000 I kind of don't get out of bed in the morning for less than 100,000 patients um <laughs> it's uh so I, I, I couldn't I couldn't say I mean the whole thing about sunscreens and absorption and is it toxic I'd want a big data set to, uh, to to make a decision on that. Great. Well, thank you so much, and thank you everyone for attending. I think I'd just like to make a last comment. I think you know there's been a lot of um, conversation about um, de decolonizing global health and stuff, and I think your um, talk actually. Uh, really supports, especially the last points that you made about the reverse migration and uh, and how, you know, there's not much research in that. And I think talking about sunlight is really important in a global health and decolonizing dermatology context. So thank you so much for... Uh, well, Monty, can I just say thank you for that? Because um, I'm not allowed to teach this in the University of Edinburgh. T two students complained about me talking about skin colour when we should be decolonizing the curriculum. And the university just said, oh my God, uh, you can't teach that. So it's great to be teaching it to you guys because I can't give this to my medical students. Well, and, so, the, so, and so it continues. And so those medical students will carry on advising sunscreen and sun avoidance for people with dark skin when, so we've got to talk about it. So Monty, thank you. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your time. And um, thank you. Okay, bye-bye everyone. Bye.